Hello, hello. Thank you for joining me in my studies today. 20 weeks ago, I decided to begin to externalize my studies by sharing vocal readings from a book a week. Today will be the first day that I share from book 20, Alan Watts, Cloud Hidden, Whereabouts Unknown. The premise of this book is the contemplative practice of refraining from classifying experience through the symbols of thought and words and as an alternative, simply experiencing them. Page five. This is the paradox of the ocean. Sand, flying spray, pebbles and shells, driftwood, sparkling water, space incredibly luminous with cloud banks along horizons, underlying skies into which one's imagination can reach without end. But under the surface of both sky and water, there is the grim business of praying. Men and birds against fish, fish against fish. The torturous process of life continuing by the painful transformation of one form or body into another. To creatures who do not anticipate and reflect imaginatively on this holocaust of eating and being eaten, this is perhaps not so terrible, but poor man, skillful beyond all other animals by being able to think in time and abstractly knowing the future, he dies before he is dead. He shrinks from the shark's teeth before they bite him, and he dreads the alien germ long, long before its banquet begins. Page six. Seabirds are transformations of fish. Men are transformations of wheat, steers, and chickens. A love for the food is the very agony of the food. To object to this inseparability of pleasure and pain, life and death, is to object to existence. But, of course, we cannot help objecting when our time comes. Objecting to pain is pain. So far as we know, the goal and the fish don't philosophize. They appear instead to enjoy life when they are eating and hate it when being eaten. But they don't reflect upon the process as a whole and say, how rough to have to work so hard for a living, or it's just hell having to watch out all the time for those damn goals. I'm sure that in their world, this is all something that just goes along with life, like having eyes or feet or wings. But man, with his astonishing ability to stand aside from himself and think about himself, in short, to comment on life, man has done something which confuses his own existence down to its roots. For the more sensitive he is, the more he finds the very act of living in conflict with his moral conscience. Upon reflection, a universe so arranged that there is no way of living except by destroying other lives seems to be a hideous mistake, not a divine, but a devilish creation. Page 8. I wonder then, would it be possible to subject to life instead of objecting to it? Is this merely playing with words or does it possibly mean something? What a statement here on page 9. The mistake which we have made, and this, if anything, is the fall of man, is to suppose that that extra circuit, that ability to take an attitude toward the rest of life as a whole, is the same as actually standing aside and being separate from what we see. We seem to feel that the thing which knows that it knows is one's essential self, that, in other words, our personal identity is entirely on the side of the commentator. We forget because we learn to ignore so subtly the larger organismic fact that self-consciousness is simply a subordinate part and an instrument of our whole being, a sort of mental counterpart of the finger-thumb opposition in the human hand. Now, which is really you, the finger or the thumb? The ocean is an environment in which the awareness of our roots can awaken, in which space so real because of the light and color can be seen as joining things instead of separating them. 
And oh yes, I have just discovered that that knocking on the walls of all space and consciousness is my own heart beating. Page 14. I do not expect to be all that solitary, for as a paradoxical person, I am also gregarious and favor the rhythm of withdrawal and return. But in the mountain, I watch the Tao, the way of non-human nature, if there is really any such thing, and feel myself into it to discover that I was never outside. Because nature peoples just as much as it forests. Our thoughts and ideas are nature, just as much as waves on the ocean and clouds in the sky. The mind grows thoughts as the field grows grass. If I think about thoughts as if there were some I, some thinker watching them from outside, there arises the infinite regression of thinking about thinking because this I is itself a thought and thoughts like trees grow of themselves. In solitude, it is easier for thoughts to leave themselves alone. It is thus a mistake to try to get rid of thoughts, for who will push them out? But when thoughts leave themselves alone, the mind clears up. If this I should try to stop the streaming or to manage it at all, there's only a futile state of tension without the intended result. But this particular kind of tension against the stream is habitual, and the frustration which it engenders is chronic. If I believe that I would like to break the habit, that very wish is another form of the same tension, and this in turn is a form of the basic unget at ability of it. We are all lunatics trying to stick pins into their own points, and it is thus that our frantic efforts to set the world to rights and extend our control over all happenings, inner and outer, are themselves the cause of most of our troubles. All force is tension against the stream. When the illusion of the you outside and apart from the stream is dissipated, you are in a position of power to work with the stream and not against it. So, there was once a big bang, and before that, the child knows this intuitively when it asks, but who made God? Change the question a little, realizing that God is eternal, and ask who makes God? You do. If God is conceived as the super authority who made the world at the distant beginning of time, he is as much your own fabrication as the notion that you yourself are something other than your stream of experiences. The idea may have been thought up by your remote ancestors, but you bought it. But if you realize that you are not this sad and silly abstract ego trying to run the world from outside, then God is made by quite another kind of you. This is the you that not only makes God, but is God. Although, to avoid the inevitable military and authoritarian associations of this name, it is better to speak of the Tao, since the Tao, which can be defined, is not the eternal Tao. From this altered standpoint, it is easy to see the sense in which you are making the world, or rather, that the world is making itself. As trees evoke sound from the wind, your eyes evoke light from fire, the structure of your organism, of your senses and nerves, endows the world with all its sensible and measurable properties. For rocks cannot seem to be hard except in relation to soft skin. All knowledge, all experience could be said to be a neural situation inside the skull. And the brain is not merely a receiver and recorder of input through the senses, it also has output because the way in which it structures its senses and nerve patterns shapes the input in the same way that a harpist, by selective plucking, brings formal melody out of a row of uniformly scaled and otherwise silent strings. I think the following quote will be a good place to end for the day. Here we are on page 24. 
Which came first, fruit or tree? Imagine the two processes as happening simultaneously, the tree growing the fruit and the fruit growing the tree, and you will see by analogy the brain shaping the environment and the environment shaping the brain. That is a clumsy way of saying that you are seeing a single process. 